Right now, we're a little over two months through the war in Ukraine. From the outset, it really looked like Russia was just gonna steamroll through Ukraine and there was nothing anybody could really do about it. Really, we all thought that Russia's military would be significantly more effective than it really turns out that it is. Thus far in the war, however, we see a completely different tale. And that tale tells us why Russia is ultimately going to lose this war. Now that statement is pretty bold, even where we're at two months into this war. And so to justify that statement, we're gonna talk about quite literally everything. We're gonna run a basic overview of the Russian military and a little bit on the Ukrainian military as well. We're gonna talk about how Russia doctrinally fights its wars. We're gonna talk about the plan that Russia had for this war. We're gonna talk about how Russia does logistics and how it was planning to sustain this war. We're gonna talk about how that plan and the sustainment has actually been executed so far in this war. And then we're gonna talk about how Russia currently is adjusting its mission and it might adjust course in the future and what impact that will have on the battle field and the war as a whole. Simply put, this isn't going to be me just throwing out an opinion and not really trying to justify it. We're going to go through everything that we possibly can, in the, at least in this video, to really understand why I think that statement and why you should too. But to state it all up front, here's the reasons for my opinion. Russia will lose because of the absolutely aggressive and asinine objectives that it set at the outset of this war and the terribly low amount of forces that it committed to this fight. It will lose because of the insufficient logistical capabilities that organically are already there for Russian BTGs, and we're gonna talk about what a BTG is here in a moment, but the terrible logistics and sustainment that it allocated for this war and the poor execution. We're gonna talk about the atrocious command and control, the poor strategic and tactical le levels of readiness. We're gonna talk about how it has really kind of improperly utilized its forces thus far. Then we're gonna talk about the poor intelligence that it had at the outset of this war as well. We're gonna talk about the just absolutely overwhelming international response that has really isolated Russia in a pretty dramatic way. And finally, we're gonna talk about the difficulties that Russia will have in sustaining the, the domestic backlash. I do also wanna know at the outset of this video that this is an extremely fluid situation. By the time that you're watching this, a lot of events on the ground may have shifted and you may see one or two things. You may see that my opinion is being validated and that a lot of the things that we've talked about in this video are really starting to continue to bear fruit and show that Russia is not going to win this war. Or you might see a dramatic change of course by Russia learning from its mistakes and we might have to have a different conversation. However, barring a dramatic, and I'm talking about history changing decision by the Russian military, I really think that they're going to struggle to achieve any of the significant objectives that they set forth in the beginning of this war. Now let's start from the very beginning, and that is looking at the Russian military and how it fights its wars. Since the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, the Russian military has undergone dramatic changes. It's also fought in a number of conflicts along the Russian periphery, from two costly wars in Chechnya, the invasion of some provinces in Georgia in 2008, and then of course the annexation of Crimea, and then the kicking off of the wars in Donetsk and Luhansk since 2014 in Ukraine, Russia has been fairly active. Also in that time, it has gone through a number of modernization efforts. And while it has managed to field newer and better equipment, it still hasn't strayed dramatically far from its Cold War philosophy on how to fight a war. That is that is to say that it places less emphasis on precision guided munitions and air power and places a large emphasis on integrated indirect fires like artillery systems and the movement of large amounts of armored forces. Speaking of guided munitions, it does have some like we're talking about like their best guided munition is the caliber cruise missile however they don't have strategic stockpiles of these weapons meaning that they have less chances to fire these off and hit targets and continue to do so and for a sustained and prolonged amount of time it's also starting to field newer hypersonic ballistic missiles however it's not yet known to what extent these have been fielded and deployed and how truly effective they are the main takeaway with guided munitions is that from the air they rely predominantly on dummy bombs. They do have some guided munitions that they drop from the air, however, you know, we've seen in Syria that that's not always 1000% effective. And certainly in Ukraine, we've seen a lot of cases on where their lack of precision guided munitions has led to problems on the ground and in the air. And when I say that, I'm really trying to contrast that with what, at least before this war, was considered to be the near, the near peer for Russia or vice versa with the US military, where guided munitions is kind of the standard thing that you use. Now 
that really is the air power, but on the ground, we have a different story here. This is really where Russia primarily focuses its strength, and that is with tanks and artillery. Doctrinally, whenever Russia is attacking a target, they will initiate with an overwhelming barrage of indirect fires. You can think conventional artillery, like howitzers or things like that, and then you can think of rocket artillery. And yes, that can also include airstrikes and caliber cruise missiles. Once they have softened the target with artillery, they then push forward with tanks. Their main armored platform for tanks is the T-72 series. Of course, they do still operate a number of older T-62s, but they also have newer T-80s and even newer, more modern T-90s. There are differences in these variants. So if you're a tank nerd and you wanna share some of those differences that makes you super excited because you're a tank nerd, comment them down in the description below. But by and large, all we really need to know for this is just that, that they really have a large number of T-72 tanks, but they also operate a lot of T-80s and T-90s. Following the tanks is their armored personnel carriers or APCs, and they operate a couple versions of these as well. They have the heavier tracked BMP, and then they have the lighter wheeled BTR. And the important distinction between wheeled and tracked vehicles is because it's wheeled, it's lighter, it can move on a number of surfaces much easier than a tracked vehicle can. However, because it's lighter, its armor is less thick, and its firepower may also be slightly reduced. You can imagine that a BMP would be integrated with a heavier armored push, like behind a lot of tanks, and then BTRs would be better for fast attack and rapid movement. I also want to specify that all of these vehicles require a ton of maintenance, especially tracked vehicles. It's not like you can just stop a tank on the side of the road to change a tire. It is a tracked vehicle, and changing the track or performing any kind of maintenance is incredibly time-consuming and really requires some personnel to do it. Also, due to the weight and the fact that it is tracked, it can potentially cause damage to roads over time. So it's best to utilize them off-road and in space. But again, because they're heavier, you really have to pay close attention to ground conditions. For instance, if the ground is solid, then you're fine. But if it's muddy, then you're gonna have a hard time getting vehicles stuck and then trying to recover said vehicles. It's not like you can pull a tank out of mud with a pickup truck. You know, you have to use a like vehicle to be able to get a vehicle unstuck. So in the terms of a tank, you have to pull another heavy vehicle and to roll it out. And again, if it's super muddy, muddy, you run the risk of getting your recovery vehicle stuck. So you really have to be very careful on ground conditions and where you are utilizing these vehicles. Now supporting all of these platforms is the infantry. And really for the purposes of this video, we wanna pay close attention to two different types of Russian soldier. There are conscripts and contract soldiers. Conscripts are enlisted into the army for one year and then after which point they have the option to sign a contract with the army or they can choose to leave the army and then go live their civilian lives as happy people. Conscript soldiers are also legally not allowed to be deployed abroad for any reason unless in an act of war. That is a key point and we're going to talk about that here in a bit. Now contract soldiers on the other hand are volunteers. They've chosen to stay in the army, they've signed a contract for a number of years, and they can legally be deployed abroad. Also, because they have been in the army a bit longer, their training's a bit better, they have a little bit more experience under their belt, and so that's another factor at play. Now, while there's a number of different types of infantry, some key types that we wanna focus here on is the Russian Airborne, or the VDV, the Spensnaz, or Russian Special Forces, and then motorized rifle infantry, which are bas basically just heavy mechanized infantry. And then we also have Rogsvar, which are basically their equivalent of the National Guard. The Rogsvardia also does a lot of rear area defense. So basically, you know, you'll have your front line and then behind that front line in friendly territory, you'll have the Rogsvardia doing a lot of the security. Or on the front line, you might have a mix of VDV and motorized infantry. And then beyond the front line in enemy territory, you might have some extra VDV and some spence now. Now, there are some key important takeaways when trying to draw direct comparisons between these types of infantry and their U.S. counterparts. The, while U.S. Airborne is really supposed to be dropped into enemy territory to cause a lot of chaos and soften the enemy up prior to a larger armored push. The VDV is much lighter by comparison and is better for regime stabilization and crowd control and really just general shows of force. That's not to say that they still cannot be effectively used in the enemy's rear area to cause some problems. However, they would need to attack with a significant amount of force to be able to accomplish something, especially against an industrialized, you know, modern military like the Ukrainian military. 
military. Now, how exactly are all of these forces organized? They are, for, they are organized in what are called Battalion Tactical Groups, or BTGs. Each BTG contains somewhere between 800 to 1,200 soldiers. I've seen even in some cases they can reach up to 2,000, and they can contain nearly two dozen tanks, nearly two dozen B, BMPs or BTRs, depending on their purpose, up to a dozen artillery vehicles, as well as a number of support vehicles. We're going to talk a lot about the logistics later in a specific section of this video dedicated towards logistics, but I do want to note right here, just to look at the vehicles in this image, each BTG organically only gets a handful of trucks. And if you remember my point that, you know, the larger vehicles, especially track vehicles like tanks, BMPs, uh, wheeled vehicles like BTRs, and then artillery, those require a lot of maintenance on their own. So you want to dedicate a pretty decent amount of logistics capability for each one of those companies. Consider also the fact that those require food food, fuel, ammunition, and then other classes of supply over time, you, you know, you really are going to end up with a pretty large logistics train to support all of these BTGs. Russia doesn't exactly do that. You will see in this chart, at least that, that the artillery section does get their own dedicated logistics sustainment elements. But again, you know, that's, <laughs> it is still something to talk about because artillery rounds are rather large. They're bulky and hard to move around. They're pretty heavy. So trying to sustain the level of fire and the volume of fire, uh, especially in a conflict like this where they'd want to continue fire pretty constantly, then you're going to have to have these trucks really just dedicated to ammunition 24-7 and not other things like food, fuel, and repair parts. That can lead to some problems. We'll talk about that in a little bit. While we're on this topic of the Russian military and it's just a default design, I do also want to point out a very critical point that is also very difficult to measure, and that is that Russia lacks a native NCO Corps. One of the U.S. Army's greatest strengths has been its NCO CEOs or non-commissioned officers. Those are basically your enlisted soldiers from the rank of sergeant on up. They have some experience, they have some leadership ability, and they are really there to provide that kind of backbone of leadership and expertise, not only for the officers in their decision making, but also for your junior enlisted to make sure that everybody is on the same page, everybody is you know disciplined, doing their work, and everything's going all right. They also allow for greater flexibility on the ground with decision making. Again, because of their expertise and because of their leadership ability, your squads really have an ability to operate, you know, at the direction of the platoon leader and, you know, in the context of the mission without having to constantly wait for orders from, let's say, like your company or battalion command. This can be a huge asset in wartime where decision making needs to be done incredibly fast and it needs to be done competently. Your NCOs are a perfect mechanism to make that happen. Now, whenever I say Russia doesn't have a strong NCO core, I mean that that can be a huge problem in Russia's proper execution execution of missions as well as its effectiveness in combat operation. This not only reduces their lethality, but it reduces their flexibility in combat and can create some significant problems, especially again, we're talking about Ukraine. This isn't a non-state actor or something like ISIS, where it's just a bunch of dudes fighting. This is an actual professional military with modern weaponry that they have to be competent in fighting against. On the Ukrainian side, you do have a slightly different beast. Bear in mind, a lot of it does kind of resemble uh, the former Soviet military. After all, they are former Soviet countries. Ukraine has gone a pretty dramatic overhaul since the 2014 conflict uh, and it has been able to rotate forces throughout Donbass and Luhansk. So there is a lot of combat experience within the Ukrainian military and they've also gotten a tremendous amount of more modern lethal aid not only before the war but since the war has kicked off. That includes more modern weapon systems like the Javelin anti-tank system, the Stinger anti-air system. A lot of Western countries are starting to send over indirect fire support like 155 millimeter self-propelled cannons a lot of other things like that as far as tanks and apcs go though they do operate a lot of similar systems to the russian systems a lot of t-72s uh, some older t-60s it's you know kind of a, a mix of that it's also probably good to point out that they have been receiving a lot of training from western countries since the 2014 war now as far as the size of either force at the outset of this war it looks like russia had allocated somewhere between 75 and 85 battalion tactical groups spread out around the border of Ukraine. So it's around 150 to 200,000 uh, Russian soldiers along the border. And that's spread from the border of Ukraine and Belarus down through the east side of Ukraine. And then of course, the border with Crimea. Ukraine, on the other hand, has a total of about 126,000 soldiers, at least at the outset of this war in the entire army. I do want to note that for both sides, not all, not all of these soldiers are infantry. Yes, there's the, you know, the, the statement of all soldiers are riflemen 
one first, but a lot of them can be dedicated towards other logistics and sustainment purposes, a lot of HR purposes. I mean, there's a lot of things that armies have to do to be able to sustain themselves and keep themselves going. Not everybody is going to be infantry. Now, here's a critical element here as far as numbers go. Prior to the war kicking off, Ukraine started developing what they call the Territorial Defense Force, and they had several months to be able to get this thing up and running. Basically, you can think of this as like a like a civilian militia almost. Like, kind of think about how like in the US, you know, you have like the National Guard, which, you know, they go and train on, you know, one week in a month, two weeks of the year, and they're ready to go at a moment's notice. But really, other than that, they're doing their civilian lives. That's kind of like what the Territorial Defense Force was, where it was just a bunch of civilians who on their weekends would train with the army and learn how to defend their home from an invading force. A lot of them were outfitted with small arms and were basically trained small unit tactics and how to fight uh, a guerrilla war against an occupying army. This force is distributed all across Ukraine. And the idea was that it wasn't an if, but when Russia started taking territory in this invasion, they would never actually secure territory. They would be constantly fighting, whether they're fighting with the professional Ukrainian army at the front line, or with territorial defense forces, as well as special forces in the rear area. This would not only disrupt logistic sustainment operations by the Russians, but it would also cause rear area security problems and, and really just really cause great attrition over time to the Russian military. Again, we've already talked about a lot of the newer weapon systems delivered to Ukraine, including javelins and stingers, uh, self-propelled artillery weapons and aircraft. One final thing before we move on to the next section is consider how large Ukraine is. Ukraine is a massive country. So distributing not only the lethal aid, but distributing forces. And again, this goes for both sides. This is a problem for everybody. It's going to take a long time. You have to be able to like physically move those assets long distance to get it to the front or to get it to wherever the fighting is. And you have to be able to move people and you have to be able to sustain them and, and give them ammunition, uh, food and water, medical sustainment, all kinds of things like 24 seven all the time. And that can be a huge challenge. That's why logistics is so important with the war effort. So on paper at the outset of the war, Ukraine was outgunned and outmatched and outnumbered by Russia. However, as the war has gone on, you've certainly seen that, that Russia is in fact outnumbered and they might even progressively as time goes on be outgunned and, out, and outmatched. There's another final topic here that again is hard to quantify but is also very important that we talk about and that is the quote unquote will to fight. Ukraine has an existential justification to fight this war. They are fighting for national survival against an external aggressor, about as existential of a justification as you can have. Russia, on the other hand, I mean, a lot of their soldiers didn't even know that they were going to war until they were already in Ukraine. And again, the premise is kind of flimsy. And by kind of flimsy, I'm being, you know, a little soft on that. It's a very flimsy argument. Their justification was the denazification and disarmament of the Ukrainian government. And again, if you see a lot of what Putin talked about, it was really a disbelief in the legitimacy of Ukraine as a country. And while, although you do have some folks far-right elements like the Azov Battalion uh, that do actually have some legit Nazis. By and large, ever since even like 2014, whenever the government flipped to a more pro-Western stance, you see a progressively shrinking far-right sector within Ukraine. And a lot of people have pointed out that Vol Volodymyr Zelensky is Jewish and has family members that were victims of the Holocaust. That's probably something that alt-right folks probably would not have advocated for. <laughs> At least logic would stand a reason. Another reason that they justified this invasion was that NATO had forced Russia's hand. And while there will certainly be a time and place for discussing that point, I think that can be a fairly nuanced conversation on, you know, from a Russian perspective, seeing since 1991, NATO progressively moving towards their own borders, it still isn't a good enough justification to initiate an illegal invasion of a neighboring country. It also needs to be said that NATO is a defensive alliance, not an offensive alliance. It wasn't moving eastward in an offensive capacity. Those eastern countries were simply fearful of the threat of a Russian invasion and needed some level of protection. And that's ultimately one of the things that Ukraine has sought after. That's ultimately why countries like Sweden and Finland might actually seek and get NATO membership is because they're concerned that what Russia is doing in Ukraine right now will happen in Sweden and Finland in the future if it is not stopped. And 
another key, and this is more of a propaganda point, but in 2014, whenever Russia, quote unquote, liberated Crimea or took over or annexed Crimea, they had a fairly strong pro-Russian presence amongst the civilians that welcomed them, that actually arrived, that actually, you know, welcomed the Russian soldiers into Crimea. And it, the new soldiers were probably told something like, you know, we're liberating the not, we're liberating these civilians from a Nazi regime. Uh, we're fighting back against NATO. These civilians will love us. They will welcome us here. They won't fight us. It's going to be fine. They're, you know, the Ukrainian military is weak. And they even planned around this and allegedly planned for this operation to take about 14 days. Like I said, we're two months into this war. It's pretty clear by now for everybody in Russia, at least that has access to actual information, at least, that the Ukrainian people don't want the Russians to invade Ukraine. Obviously. Shocker. So Russia is, so the will to fight in the mind and heart of a Russian soldier isn't as existential as a Ukrainian soldier, but it also isn't moral. It is, you know, it's built on lies and deceit from the Russian government. And ultimately, whenever they see that and whenever they're put into hard times, that will make an impact on the effectiveness of the Russian military, as well as the actual integrity of the Russian force as time goes on. Now let's talk about the plan for this conflict. The main objective that Russia set forth in its war plan was complete regime change in Ukraine. They didn't want to deal with a pro-Western Zelensky government anymore. They wanted to completely wipe it out and install a new Russia-centric government. That being said, their statements indicated a little bit of an off-ramp. You might remember earlier that we talked about how in 2014 they kicked off small conflicts in the Donetsk and Luhansk regions. Well, both regions had their own administrative administrative governments in the DNR and in the Donetsk National Republic in the Luhansk People's Republic. I think that's how they're named. Either way, both were basically puppet regimes for Russia and allowed Russia to basically continue a war against Ukraine in Ukraine for basically the past seven years. Basically the off-ramp was instead of taking the entire whole of Ukraine, they could instead cover just the administrative province, which included, you know, other chunks of Ukraine that hadn't yet been taken. All this being said, to accomplish this, they accommodated somewhere between 150,000 and 200,000 soldiers to achieve these goals. And again, we've already said this, but it's somewhere between 75 to 85 battalion tactical groups. And they were spread from Belarus Belarus, all the way down the, the rest of the north and eastern borders with Russia, and all the way down into Crimea. Now, on the first few days, Russia basically initiated a number of fires, including caliber cruise missiles and other ballistic missile systems, and the use of long-range bombers and fighter jets. Instead of seeing the prolonged air campaign that we all kind of anticipated happening, as as like say, let's what we saw with uh, you know the air campaign over Iraq to kick off that invasion. This really only lasted a few hours before ground forces actually started to move into Ukraine. It's important to note that for this plan to be successful, Russia had to have dominance in the air, and to this day, they do not yet have that. From there, we can divide this war plan into three distinct axes, and we're going to talk about each and every one. The first axis is to the north, around Kiev, basically pushing from Belarus. The idea was to isolate and seize the capital as soon as possible, you know, hopefully in their mind within four 14 days of the start of the invasion. The next axis was in the east from Belgorod, and basically that was to isolate Sumy and Kharkiv. And that would have a couple distinct directions of advance, uh, one pushing west across towards Kiev, and then the other pushing south uh, past Kharkiv, basically trying to surround and trap Ukrainian forces oriented around Donbass Luhansk. And then the third axis of advance was north from Crimea, pushing west towards Odessa, and then east towards the port city of Mariupol. And of course, that eastward push from the southern advance was really an attempt to try to link up a land bridge from, the, from Luhansk to Crimea. There were additional concerns that Russia would initiate other fronts within this war. For instance, Russia occupies a region in Moldova called Transnistria. At the moment of this recording, they have not yet initiated those forces and engaged them either in Moldova or Ukraine. However, certainly right now, and this is the 29th of April that I'm recording this, it really looks like they might be ramping up, you know, something there. But we're going to talk about that because that is a little different from this current war plan that we're talking about and more towards like today's war plan. There's a little bit of a difference there, but hold on for just a bit. But all of this was supposed to take no greater than 14 days time, which is a very aggressive timeline. 
especially given the amount of forces that Russia allocated for this mission set and the strength of the Ukrainian military. And to say nothing of the distances that these forces would have to travel while fighting. Logistically for this war, it didn't seem that Russia really had a firm understanding of the really the demands that this war plan was going to have on their forces. To kind of understand where a lot of these issues happen, let's kind of take a minute and, and analyze how Russia does logistics sustainment. They're primarily focused on the utilization of railways, as that's obviously going to be the most efficient use of transit and sustainment for military forces. And, and Russia does maintain a pretty solid rail railhead ops uh, uh, capacity within their military and certainly they have a lot of strong railways within their country and they also have interconnectivity with ukraine so that you know these are all pluses there's also a major rail junction in the russian city of belgorod not too far from ukraine that actually has connections to kharkiv taking kharkiv would enable them to set up a railhead and a logistics area around the area of kharkiv so that way they could basically push you know everything from reinforcements to logistics sustainment from belgorod into kharkiv and then enable further maneuver deeper into Ukraine from the Northeast. However, Russia instead chose to simply surround and isolate Kharkiv and not take the railhead and not take the junction not take the rail junction and that's led to some problems which we'll talk about in a little bit as far as non-rail logistics goes that's really where a lot of russia's logistical woes start to become apparent we've already talked about the typical battalion tactical group and how logistically they don't necessarily allocate enough organic logistics and sustainment assets per btg i do want to emphasize the importance of wheeled logistics sustainment modes of transport like trucks and trailers and all that and those kinds of things because again that allows you greater freedom of maneuver remember that trains can really only go wherever there are train tracks and if the enemy blows up a portion of the track then you're gonna have to go repair the track it delays the time that the train can come in those kinds of things happen but with the truck i mean you can literally drive it anywhere that enables pretty great maneuver for your line units russia doesn't organically allocate enough enough truck transport per btg and so whenever we're talking about you know prioritizing what kinds of supply that they'd have to push forward to sustain their their units at the front line they'd really have to prioritize ammunition and you saw all kinds of shortages from food to fuel and like from even before the war. There was a video that I saw before the war even started in Belgorod where basically a platoon of Russian soldiers got stuck at a railway and they weren't even given food. They had to basically rely on the Russian town of Belgorod to get food for the week. And it was just kind of like setting the stage for, okay, they're gonna have some serious problems once they finally start getting into Ukraine, which they have. And now you're seeing cases where Russian soldiers are basically foraging and stealing from houses and, you know, just doing those kinds of things to be able to get their food because they're not getting it supplied from the Russian military. You're seeing convoys getting stopped on the road because they're running out of fuel. And really, it's just the whole the whole supply chain has broken down in a lot of areas, or at least it had while it was going on. Another huge issue is rear area security and logistics convoy security. They really have precious few supply trucks that they can afford to lose. And, and so they really have to protect those. And we've already talked about the territorial defense forces and the ability for you know the Ukrainian military to break down into smaller units and engage in the Russian rear area we really started to see a lot of that and you know especially whenever Russia started pushing down to Kiev and whenever they started sending an axis you know from the east all the way across the west to relieve the forces around Kiev you you started seeing a lot of issues where Russian logistics convoys were having some serious security problems and basically getting completely wiped or abandoned along the route and that caused some serious logistics problems you know along the tip of the spear and along Along the for and with the forces around Kiev where the logistics just wasn't getting to them and they were starting to run out of everything from ammunition to fuel to food. So knowing that logistics has been a huge struggle for Russia along within this war plan, how has everything really gone in reality? There are three huge issues that have plagued Russia since the outset of the war, you know, despite regardless of which axis we're talking about. So we're going to talk about those up front and then we're going to break down each axis of advance. First, up until about a few weeks ago, Russia hadn't been operating with a single combined army commander. As far as like joint decision making goes, they were having not just problems coordinating the army with the Air Force with the Navy, which is kind of a difficult challenge in and of itself. They were having challenges coordinating, you know, a tank unit from an air defense unit. And that would allow, that would basically leave tank units out in the open to get bombed from drones and then air defense units without protection. So then they'd get abandoned in a field or shot up in a convoy somewhere. All the while the Air Force is kind of doing its own thing 
obviously losing its own planes because it's not integrating with air defense zones and stuff like that. It's, it's a whole mess. Finally, the Russians named General Dornikov to head the entire invasion. And since then, the plan has obviously changed. It's changed to the current plan that we're seeing today. We'll talk about that here in a bit, but I just wanted to point out that at least for the first month, you know, Russia was just operating without a joint army commander. Another huge problem that kind of stemmed from this was terrible command and signal and terrible command and control. It's They've basically been memed online for not having encrypted radios. And so they've had to use basically unencrypted civilian radio technology to communicate with one another. That creates a number of issues, as I'm sure you can imagine, where the Ukrainians could intercept those radio transmissions and understand exactly what the Russians were doing. But there were also issues with Russian command and control nodes reaching their forward units. So basically, like think like a Russian colonel or a general trying to, you know, direct units that are forward fighting the Ukrainians deep in the Ukraine. It became such an issue that it seems like a number of Russian generals moved their command posts forward to the fight and that allowed them to get targeted by Ukrainian fire. Up to this point that this video is being recorded, there's somewhere around like 10 Russian generals that have been killed in this fight. Uh, to say nothing of the number of like colonels and other high ranking officers that have been killed, it's it's been a complete mess. Second, another huge issue in Ukraine for the Russians has been the air. Again, we, we said that a huge part of this plan it really hinged on whether or not Russia could take control and maintain control of the air. And they have failed to do that this entire time. And that's to say that any attack or defense, any, any military action in general, can really be greatly aided or greatly degraded with whether or not you control the air. The fact that Ukraine has been able to maintain not just a pretty complex and, and networked air defense network, but also, you know, the ability to strike from the air really says a lot about Russia's ability in its own military to be able to integrate air defense and air attack and basically attack the Ukrainians from the sky. Russia has lost dozens of aircraft so far from combat aircraft to helicopters. It's not looked good and that even includes potentially two IL-76 airplanes that basically carry Russian VDV paratroopers as well as their mechanized armor equipment. Again, there, there hasn't yet been confirmation 100% that both of those were in fact shot down, but that's been said often that at the early days of the war, whenever this war plan was going on and whenever Russia was making their mad dash to Kiev, two of these planes got shot down. That really was, That's really an indication of one, a lack of solid intelligence, which we'll talk about here in a moment, but two, a lack of effective air attack to be able to take out Ukrainian air defense systems and also provide proper security for those aircraft. Because of those issues, Russia has had to act a lot more conservatively in its offensive operations because, again, it's not operating under the assumption that it controls the sky, or at least it can't, it, because whenever it does, it's losing aircraft. But whenever it does act a bit more conservatively, that slows down the pace of advance. And obviously, time is of the essence for the Russians. They cannot afford to be losing time, and they're being bled everywhere that they're going. Their, their attrition rate is incredibly high, and a huge part of that is because they do not control the air. But even whenever they do launch airstrikes and you know do things from the air their lack of sophisticated and plentiful precision guided munitions it really dilutes the impact that their air power actually has contrast that with ukraine and their ability to integrate drones with tb2s and a number of other air assets there's i mean all kinds of videos coming out right now of them using you know makeshift drones to drop munitions just makeshift you know directly from the drone like mortar rounds and grenades and stuff like that these makeshift solutions are a lot more more precise, oddly enough, than Russia's use of unguided munition. Third, Russia failed to conduct proper intelligence operations prior to the initiation of this invasion. Not only did Russia fail to assess the proper size, strength, resilience, composition of the Ukrainian forces, they've also failed to properly assess the public opinion of the Ukrainian civilian populace. Again, their entire theory was that Ukraine was a Nazi state and that the Ukrainian people wanted to be freed by the Russian military. So imagine Imagine the surprise of these conscript soldiers. But again, it's a democratic country that has a that has a dwindling alt-right scene, and the people have in fact become more and more pro-Western since the Russians annexed Crimea and have kicked off the wars in Donbass and Luhansk. The people weren't about to welcome the Russians with open arms and flowers, they were about to welcome them with bombs and bullets. They also, and this is a very crucial point that I think we're gonna be talking about for a long time, is Russia failed to conduct proper self-assessment on their own levels of readiness. From a belief that the soldiers were trained at a pretty competent 
management level individually to the utilization and implementation of what have been nicknamed cope cages. Basically, it's these, you know, metal cages welded onto the top of tanks, you know, under this belief that that would somehow stop a javelin top, basically. So a javelin, whenever it's fired, it hits the, the top of the tank where the armor is the weakest. So the belief was that these cope cages would hit the, would basically be hit by the missile first and, and destroy the missile before it hit the tank. That's not a, that's not what happened. And that's why they're called cope cages because they don't do anything. The tanks are still getting popped left and right by javelins and other anti-tank systems. But it's not just that, it's also the total force allocation that they dedicated to this fight. And even the logistical demands that their own army would need as it's carrying out this mission. Russia just flat out did not initiate this war with any kind of a proper understanding whatsoever of what it was getting itself into and what it had to be able to do this mission with. They also allegedly, and this is if you're trusting their messaging, that they, they didn't really that they had sent conscripts for it into Ukraine. Again, remember earlier we talked about conscripts where it's not legal to send them abroad uh, um, pending an act of war. And to this point, Russia hasn't formally declared war on Ukraine. So it was illegal for them to send conscripts for it. That created a bit of a domestic backlash where obviously the parents who had lost their children in this war were getting upset that their children who were conscripts had died in Ukraine or the children were complaining, you know, that they were in Ukraine. So if, if you believe Russia in the place them with contract soldiers, I mean, that's still a pretty bad mess up. Another huge and, you know, seemingly basic element that they failed to conduct with regard to intelligence in Ukraine was even just the seasons and the weather. They chose to attack Ukraine at the beginning of the springtime, whenever the ground was starting to thaw, the snow was starting to melt, and it was getting muddy. This means that all those heavy tracked vehicles that Russian ground forces rely so heavily on from the BTR to their air defense systems, which are also tracked to their T-series tanks they were they basically were being restricted to ukrainian roads because anytime they went off the road they were getting stuck in the field in all the mud this is a huge problem because again whenever you're fighting you want maximum mobility and they are limited to just the road so that enabled the ukrainians to have full mobility outside the roads and ambush the russians left and right it had disastrous results especially for the northern push towards kiev and the eastern push also a little bit towards kiev but also around kharkiv all of these are possibly reasons why Putin chose to put the FSB chief under house arrest. Sucks to suck. Now, nowhere did all this coalesce into a giant, terrible mess than their push to Kiev. In the north, specifically in the push to Kiev, the first night saw a lot of indirect fire, specifically airstrikes and precision guided munitions like Caliber and Iskander cruise missile strikes around Kiev. However, shortly after the initial barrage, the Russians then initiated an attack with soldiers with VDV and Spetsnaz forces on, a, air, on an airstrip north of Kiev in a, in a suburb called Hostomel. The likely objective for this attack was to seize the airport and then airlift additional forces into that airport and then use that as a staging ground for a full-on push to seize the city of Kiev. That night, there were some rumors that the Russians had prepared up to 25 IL-76 aircraft to be able to fly into Hostomel Airport, loaded with VDV soldiers and their supporting equipment and vehicles. It then became clear, though, that that it was not going to be an easy fight as the Russians had assumed. After only a few hours, that initial attack was repelled by the Ukrainians, with the remaining forces on the ground being scattered into the surrounding area. Russia would follow this failure with a large helicopter assault on the airport the following morning. The objective was the same, albeit with a larger commitment of forces. Again, though, this was repelled after basically a full day of fighting. While all this was going on, mechanized units from Belarus were moving south towards Kiev. The first first objective was to capture the Chernobyl exclusion zone. They continued their advance on two axes of advance one on the east side through Cherniv, and then one on the west side towards Hostomel. You might have heard of the famed 40 mile convoy around this time, and this is basically where all of that was taking place. Ukrainian forces were able to stop the Russian advance outside of Kiev, and they were able to bleed those forces pretty much the entire time that they were committed around the city of Kiev and around Hostomel airport. That said, by the time the fight started to set in, the logistical woes started to also creep in for the Russians. That 40 mile convoy was 
there for a number of days and it may not have been just because of a strategic pause it might have actually been because they were simply running out of food fuel and ammunition and simply could not conduct their attack on kiev they may also have been waiting for additional forces to push into the city because again kiev is a fairly large city and they did not have a significant number of forces to push into the city they were they were pretty clearly outnumbered that additional reinforcement could have come from the country of belarus as at the time there were some rumors that they had been committed and you could see their identification with a red square on their vehicles however that rumor is really just a rumor it wasn't entirely confirmed that could have also been additional forces from the eastern axis of advance through Kharkiv, or well i guess i should say around Kharkiv. that being said we're going to talk about what happened to that axis here in a moment after a number of days and no attack on kiev was actually conducted the russians finally decided to withdraw from kiev the losses to these forces were fairly immense some figures have estimated up to 22 battalion tactical groups were rendered combat ineffective, some of which whittled down to just a handful of soldiers. And again, we're going to talk about what Russia is currently doing with these forces here in a moment, but that is what happened in the northern advance towards Kiev. In the east, a kind of a similar tale emerged where Russia initiated that first night with a bombardment on a number of military targets with indirect fires, not only cruise missiles, but airstrikes and also rocket artillery. The fighting there had been going on for around seven years. I mean, again, this includes the borders of the Donetsk and Luhansk where a lot of this fighting has been going on since 2014. So the Russians are fairly familiar with the Ukrainian positions and vice versa. We've also talked about how Kharkiv is a major rail junction that also connects to Belgorod and that could be a very important strategic objective for the Russian forces. That would also allow for a push to Kiev with better logistical support because again Russia relies on trains for logistics and Kharkiv can accommodate. However instead of attempting to overwhelm the city's defenses Russia opted instead to simply bypass car. They also chose to bypass the city of Sumy and instead blitz basically straight line west over towards Kiev. Both of those cities continue to hold out against the Russians, albeit Sumy was ultimately abandoned. So really Kharkiv is the only city on this list that is currently, you know, still seeing fighting right now as of the moment that this video is being recorded. So while Russia fixed forces in Kharkiv and Sumy, they sent another axis of advance straight west towards Kiev and that is where things started to get pretty rough for them. Kiev is a long ways away. I mean, remember how big the country of Ukraine is? And these forces are trying to push all the way across the country to Kiev. Not only are they fighting Ukrainian military forces, they're also contending with territorial defenses. Even worse, it's not just the Ford elements that are conducting the fighting. It is literally every element along the entire push that is conducting these the, the fighting on this push towards Kiev. The hardest hit elements were the logistics elements that they could really not afford to lose. Since they decided not to take Kharkiv and create a supply area there, they really had to rely on trucks to supply this push towards Kiev. And again, the longer they, and again, the further they push, the longer these trucks have to drive and the more opportunities for attack that they fall under along these routes. And Russia continued to struggle with logistical convoy security. We would see time and time again, either convoys completely abandoned or completely destroyed along their main supply routes. It also didn't help that it was muddy. Again, they failed to do proper recon on the weather. They were really restricted to the roads. And so that prevented greater maneuver for this axis of advance. They couldn't spread out and, you know, conduct a broad face of fire. They had to stick to the roads because so that way their vehicles wouldn't get stuck. And that opened their flanks up to all kinds of havoc. Ultimately, the further this axis continued to push, the closer to Kiev they got, the less supply that they actually ended up having. So after, again, a couple of weeks of this, the Russians ultimately decided to abandon this push and withdraw its forces. While it would withdraw its forces around Sumy and in this axis of advance towards Kiev, they did leave their forces around Kharkiv. In the south, Russia saw much more success than they saw in the north. They split their forces from Crimea in two different directions, one pushing west towards Mikolaev, one pushing west towards Odessa, and then the other pushing east towards Mariupol. The forces pushing east towards Mariupol were likely there to try to isolate the city of Mariupol and in fact take it ultimately but also create a land bridge with the occupied province of Luhansk. The forces going west were likely trying to obviously do the same thing with Odessa as was being done with Mariupol, as well as to try to create a land bridge with the disputed province of Transnistria in Moldova. Again, another province that Russia claims and occupies that really belongs to 
Moldova. The, throughout the first like month of this invasion, there were a lot of concerns of amphibious landings, both in Odessa and Mariupol. The Russian Navy would maintain a presence on either side of Crimea to kind of create some sort of sense that they would be able to conduct such a such an attempt. However, ultimately Mariupol is the only place that they actually launched a formal attack. And that's because the Western advance would be stopped around the town of Kurzhan and then ultimately would have to hold at the town of Mykolaiv. The Eastern advance would take the towns of Melitopol and Brodansk and would ultimately begin to surround Mariupol. That is a siege that would last for many, many weeks. As of the time that I'm filming this, they have pretty much taken the city and have surrounded the, As the Azovstal steel mill. But again, they haven't really chosen to storm the steel mill. It's likely that they're just going to surround and isolate it and really just starve the soldiers and civilians that are trapped inside out. This axis would, however, struggle at the river city of Zaporizhia, and they would ultimately not push any further further north from there. As a whole, I'm arguing that the Russian war plan has been a complete failure. From the outset, although the Russians stated that they had limited goals in Ukraine, their real goal was regime change in Kiev. And not only that, they had an aggressive timetable. They wanted to decapitate the Ukrainian government in 14 days and install a new one. And after 14 days, they had not only failed to take Kiev, they had failed to really produce any kind of success, except again, mild success in the South. As of right now, they have decided to pivot and focus on a smaller area of operations. Uh, basically, they still control an area around the city of Kurzhan. They still haven't taken the city of Kurzhan, and they're trying to push south of Izium uh, in the northeast towards their lines of control in the south, thereby isolating Ukrainian forces that were arrayed around Donetsk and Luhansk. This also takes us to a more dangerous path, potentially. As Russia becomes more increasingly desperate, they may become more likely to utilize non-conventional weapons like chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear. I do want to make a note, however, that Russia doesn't really classify tactical nuclear weapons as unconventional. In fact, doctrinally, they are at the top of what they would classify as conventional weapon systems for indirect fire. Still, no doubt, it isn't lost on them the significance of deploying such a weapon would bring. Domestically, Russia has devolved to Soviet levels of repression. From jailing protesters to potentially shutting down their borders to a potential potential partial or full mobilization of the of the Russian populace, Russia is feeling the heat. Russia's economy has been cut off from the international system and that is something that they could not really afford to have happen. They don't have the thriving domestic economy like a lot of the Western economies do. And so while of course there are some additional levers to pull for Western countries as far as sanctioning Russia goes and of course energy dependence, and, and Russia still has some tools in its toolbox to prop its economy up, really time is not on Russia's side. Ultimately, it will run out of tools, it will run out of money, and the economy economy is just going to fall apart. So this creates a situation for Russia that's really a ticking time bomb. They really cannot afford to have this war go on any longer than it already has been, but they need to get some sort of success on the ground to be able to take back to the Russian people and say, look, you know, we had this special operation. It wasn't a war and we were able to get these things out of the Ukrainian. And while this wasn't exactly something that the Russian people really wanted, it's something that they may actually, they may be content with just an end to the war and into and, and hostilities in general, and the chance that their economy will have some extra breathing room if any sanctions could be lifted. However, anything short of any kind of, you know, actual concessions that Russia could pull, any kind of success that Russia could achieve, Putin's going to have some problems politically. All the while, they have to do this before their economy collapses and before their military just completely shuts down as they've been completely ineffective in Ukraine. And none of that is even acknowledging the occupation of Ukrainian territories. This is just their con this is just them fighting on the front line. They're going to have to figure out what they're going to do with the territories that they have occupied, that land bridge from Luhansk to Crimea that they've occupied through Mariupol. What are they going to do with the area to the northeast around Kharkiv? Even the disputed provinces from 2014, can they continue to occupy those territories as well, or Crimea? Ukraine, no doubt, is not going to give up that fight. They're going to continue to fight until they can take back their country. And so unless Russia has answers or they're able to come up with some sort of a deal which is highly unlikely they're gonna have they're gonna have some serious problems trying to occupy those territories for the long term and i just don't see it so that takes us to where i'm making this video R russia nixed the siege of kiev instead of directly decapitating the ukrainian government they've instead opted for more mild objectives they've also allegedly named a new operational commander general dortnikov he like just about every other 
Russian general has some experience in Syria. He's been characterized as competent, but not that creative. Again, another problem is that with them isolating Donetsk and Luhansk, that really means that they can focus greater combat power in that area. However, it also means that they're not getting the full political objectives that they set forth at the outset of this war. They are still facing issues with logistics and air power, and that's something that they're going to continue to face until this war is over. They simply have not taken control of the air. They probably will not take control of the air, and they will continue to face problems on the ground until they figure something out on that domain. They're also still facing logistical challenge, although albeit it's less pronounced due to the shortening of the distances and their building up of supply areas and other logistics sustainment infrastructure in the occupied territories. It does seem like they are building up some railhead ops around Izium and Mariupol. However, time will tell if that actually provides enough sustainment for their forces in the area. One of the most glaring issues is the question of combat effectiveness. As of right now, there are some estimates that they have somewhere between 90 and 95 battalion tactical groups uh, assembled or deployed in Ukraine right now. And their total military has somewhere between 120 to 130 battalion tactical groups. So a significant portion of their entire military is fighting in Ukraine right now. Those battalion tactical groups that were rendered combat ineffective in the push to Kiev, some of which were pushed back into Russia to be refit and regenerated. Others were cobbled together into new battalion tactical groups and deployed towards Izium. The forces that were pushed into Russia to be regenerated, that's not exactly like a video game where you just, you know, wait a turn and then those forces are back. That's gonna take a long, long time. It's gonna take years, if not decades, for those forces to regenerate. Some estimates have shown that Russia has lost up to a third or even over a third of its total tank force. A third of the personnel originally allocated for this war and a fairly significant portion of its air force. They've even suffered a number of losses at sea to include the Moskva, the flagship of their Black Sea fleet. Ironic. Not all of these losses were combat kills or injuries and a lot of these, a lot of these soldiers that were lost in this war ultimately either just surrendered or abandoned their position entirely. And that has been a problem since the outset of this war of Russian soldiers basically parking their vehicles and leaving. Some have even outright defected and joined the Ukrainian forces. To backfill this problem, Russia has attempted to recruit forces externally from places like Syria, Libya, or the Central African Republic. They've also pulled forces from other parts of Russia like Dagestan or Chechnya. Although you might see a lot of images and videos of the Chechen forces, they're basically Instagram soldiers, you know, doing rear area security and taking in Instagram photos. And it'll also, and it's also as of this moment unknown if they'll even meet the recruitment goals from domestically within Russia to backfill their personnel requirements. Again, I don't think that they're going to be able to meet their needs and without a partial mobilization of the Russian populace. Again, a costly and a dramatic escalation of conflict that would require a formal declaration of war on the country of Ukraine. And again, that climbs us a little bit further up the escalation ladder. I have some questions on if that's really something that Putin would really want want to do, or if he would be more likely to simply just extract anything that he can get as of right now, not continue to escalate, and then really just do damage control domestic domestically. So you might be a little confused right now on why Russia is doing this right now if they haven't formally declared war. You can think of this kind of like a, I mean, it's not obviously a direct one-to-one -one comparison, clearly, uh, but think of like a policing action with the United States where the president can send forces into combat areas around the world for any particular reason. Uh, with without a formal declaration of war. That's basically, that's kind of similar, I guess, in, in theory to what Russia is doing right now, albeit it's not really to fight bad guys, it's to conduct an unjustified war. So the so the legality of this conflict is, is not, enough. it's comparing apples to oranges here, but that's the best comparison I could think of in my head. That being said, with policing actions, the US hasn't formally declared war since World War II, and so, but yet we've been in a number of conflicts. Russia also hasn't really formally declared war uh, and so, however, they are engaged in this conflict, obviously. If Russia declares war, that not only unlocks the utilization of conscripts abroad, which can backfill a lot of positions, but they can also have a partial or full mobilization of the Russian populace, which can really get a lot of things going for them militarily. Potentially, and they, there, there's certainly a world where that also renders itself ineffective in Ukraine, but, you know, only time can tell, and hopefully we don't find out. But from an equipment standpoint, Russia has lost a serious portion of its equipment in Ukraine. 
Those vehicles can take time and are expensive to produce. And again, talking about Russia's economy, they really can not afford to lose these vehicles at all. They're looking at probably the worst economic collapse that modern Russia has ever faced ever. So this is something that they're really gonna have to brace for impact for and not really basically have to dedicate the, remain, the remainder of their economy towards rebuilding forces. There have been some rumors of Russia seeking support from China to backfill their equipment, their equipment shortages however it's yet been seen on if china will actually oblige so what are we likely to see in the future well i think that right now russia is going to continue to try to isolate ukrainian forces around Donetsk and luhansk however i think that they are going to fail to ultimately do that i think that the attrition that they are facing right now while facing the ukrainian forces is simply too high for them to sustain they're going to reach an inflection point are they going to initiate a partial or full mobilization or are they simply going to leave they can try to maintain a defense and, uh, and simply try to occupy and defend the territories that they've taken. But I still think that that's not going to be a permanent solution. I think that Ukraine will continue to generate forces. They're getting a lot of more advanced equipment from the West. They're moving a lot of forces in. A lot of their reserves that have yet to be committed are being committed. And I think that if Russia chooses to go on the defense in their new occupied territories, then Ukraine could launch offenses and attempt to regain a lot of the ground that they've lost. I think if Russia becomes becomes increasingly more desperate than they may attempt to use what we would consider to be non-conventional weapons. However, I think that a lot of the language coming from NATO may deter them from that. But again, that's really where things start to escalate. If they do use non-conventional weapons, it's un it's unclear if we'll see any kind of wider intervention from NATO or not. The current rumor as of right now is that Putin told Dornikov to achieve victory before the May 9th Victory Day Parade, which is ironically when they commemorate their victory over the Nazis in World War II. Yet here they are basically doing Nazi stuff in Ukraine and they're wanting to celebrate that on May 9th. But yeah, I think that they've already failed on their objectives because again, their ob original objectives were fairly aggressive. They've already failed at those. So they've pulled back to more mild objectives. And I think that they're going to fail at those as well, especially before May 9th. All of that doesn't even acknowledge the fact that Russia has now become a pariah state. They've been isolated from the international system. They've been cast away from a lot of the, its people have been taking back taken back to the Soviet days. Putin originally took power because he was able to basically promise the Russian people that he could take them back to global preeminence from the ashes of the Soviet Union. He took them from an economic catastrophe to basically being what again, he, we Americans thought was a near peer competitor. And in just two months, he proved all of us wrong, collapsed his own economy, and is now in a situation where if he can't figure something out drastically, then he might actually have a problem with maintaining his own grip on power. That's another one of the ticking time bombs. There's a ticking time bomb of the economy. There's a ticking time bomb of the military just completely collapsing in Ukraine. And then there's a ticking time bomb domestically on the Russian people simply having enough and being sick and tired of being subject to this conflict, losing everything economically for this one dude named Putin and whatever this is that's going on in his head. Militarily, we've already talked about all the problems that they're facing in Ukraine and how it's really just a matter of time for them to ultimately shift to area defense. And then however long it takes for Ukraine to just, to just push them out of the country in general. So again, talking about objectives here, Russia failed in their, in their aggressive original objectives for complete regime change and occupation of Ukraine. I believe Believe that they will fail in their now more modest objectives in Ukraine. And I think that they're going to begin to see some more problems in their near abroad and throughout the world in areas of interest for them as well. Again, a huge portion of their military has been dedicated to just Ukraine. This is going to have ripple effects for their forces in Syria, uh, their interests in Libya and, and throughout Africa, as well as throughout the Caucasus. I mean, Armenia and Azerbaijan certainly haven't remediated any of their conflict yet. Uh, even Japan is starting to claim some of the disputed islands in the Pacific. And Russia has precious few forces to react to that if things escalate there. I don't, again, and I don't think that they will, but I'm just saying, like they, they, there are forces to be able to work with and react dynamically to situations around the world they're being depleted pretty significantly right now. And even whatever they do have is gonna to have to be dedicated towards the defense of whatever they've taken in Ukraine and the defense of the regime domestically. So the real question that will either prove my thesis right or wrong is can Russia meet all of these challenges worldwide, meet the challenges in Ukraine and meet the challenges domestically, basically indefinitely.
Can they hold off the Ukrainian military and maintain the areas that they've captured? Can they quell the discontent that's growing within Russia right now? Can they save their economy from complete and utter disaster? And can they continue to act, you know, in other areas of interest throughout the world, throughout Africa, throughout Asia and Europe, in the same kind of force that they had before? If their performance in Ukraine tells us anything, it is that that is incredibly doubtful. The frightening part is Russia also possesses one of the largest stockpiles of nuclear weapons in the world, if not the largest. And that is the only area that they have parity with anybody. They are beneath NATO conventionally, so nuclear weapons is the only area that they actually have parity, that they can actually force everybody to slow down and stop. Unless they use nuclear weapons in Ukraine, they're gonna lose this war. Heck, even if they do use nuclear weapons in Ukraine, they're gonna lose this war. It doesn't matter if this takes days, weeks, months, or years, they're gonna lose. And that is going to have some serious impacts not only throughout Russia, but throughout the rest of the world. Gone are the days where the world was really a cold war between the United States and Russia. I think Russia will really always be a player as long as it's, as long as Putin's there, you know, he's always gonna keep Russia in contention for some reason. But I also think that it's really now shifting towards the US and China. But with all of that being said, that's my reason for why I think that Russia is going to lose this war. If this video was helpful or informative, be sure to drop a like button. This took a lot of time for me to make, so I'd really appreciate it. Drop a comment with what you think as well, and be sure to hit that subscribe button. Maybe I'll make other videos similar to this in the future. Who knows? But anyway, I'll see you all next time. Bye.